Recently, what is considered to be the best Race to World First event took place. After five years of the Race to World First being a live stream event, it came down after 13 days of grueling gameplay to just less than 1% between the two top teams with Echo Esports managing to clutch out a victory. I was lucky enough to be at the event, and today we're going to look at the epic journey that Echo went on, the ups, the downs, why this event is not only considered to be the best ever, why it's going to be talked about for years to come, and how a game that is celebrating its 19th birthday dominated people's minds and screens, resulting in over 450,000 people watching it all unfold live. So, that is devastating! $200,000! This race began differently from all the rest. One of the most talked about situations around the world first is when you can actually start playing. North America, where the reigning champions Team Liquid play, get their new raid a day earlier than the European-based Echo. This staggered reset timing is something neither guild enjoys, but with Blizzard unwilling to change it so far, it has to be built into both guild strategies. For the first time, Echo announced that they were going to raid on the North American servers, which led to massive speculation from the community as to whether they had prepared all their resources for this move. Of course, the reality was that they were going to defeat the far easier, normal mode on characters they had made in North America and claim the not so coveted normal mode world first. While this was obviously a publicity stunt, revealing the ending cinematic of the raid live for all to see and get early attention on them, it wasn't only that. The secondary objective was to have a full day head start testing the final boss in its simpler version. The Race to World First guilds use quite an extensive tech team to build add-ons and timers to aid them against the more complex bosses. Farak, the final boss of the raid, is completely untested. Everything the guilds know about it comes from the in-game dungeon journal. This doesn't compare to actually seeing it and testing whether all the tech work is operational. The keen-eyed among you will have noticed that as Echo reached Farak, one of its players swapped out of the group before they engaged the boss. The idea was that Echo would defeat the boss for its viewers, but after that, they could come back as many times as they wanted off stream to mess around with the boss for testing. Perhaps a sign of things to come, but this went wrong. As the stream went into chill mode until the European reset at 5am the following day, Echo went back in to test the boss using the character that left the group and had Farak still alive. Or so it should have been. For whatever reason, it didn't work. Upon re-entering the raid, Farak was dead, which isn't what should happen. For the normal and heroic modes, Blizzard allows players to leave whenever they like and come back to finish the bosses they didn't do. It's a great system for guilds or solo players to not have to commit to doing an entire raid in a single session. Echo's sneaky plan was shambled. Their only solution then was to go to bed and come back early the next day and repeat the process as they still wanted that testing. Preparing for the Race to World First has become so complex that it takes all the guilds across the world months of preparation. Each guild spends thousands of hours preparing literally hundreds of characters amongst its 25 to 28 player roster for the big day. Farming the previous raids on as many alt characters as possible, acquiring every scrap of gear they can to not only make the start of the raid smoother, but also give them as many chances as possible of having one extremely strong character. One thing you can't prepare for, though, is any content that is not available until the new season is released. Typically, the raid releases a week or two after the new season goes live. This patch contains a lot of non-raid content that's for every player of the game to enjoy. Raiders will look deep into this to see if there is any advantage to be gained, and this time, there was. A new reputation system and rewards became available, including a permanent rune giving minor power, although guilds do have access to an endless temporary rune system providing the same benefit, so it's minor, but also a high-value item upgrade crest that may have given a player an upgrade they wouldn't have otherwise had. So the grinding commenced. However, it was discovered that some of the seeds you needed to interact with to gain the reputation were bugged. 
Through a process, you can essentially farm them endlessly and far more quickly than intended. Now, Blizzard's policy on these kinds of exploits has been inconsistent over the years, so a decision has to be made by the players to save the many hours of doing it legitimately or risk the ire of Blizzard by doing it far quicker. On the morning of the launch, Blizzard did in fact take action. They decided to roll back characters that had used the exploit. Rolling back is resetting a character's reputation standing to before they started using the bug and removing the rewards they had earned. When I arrived into Echo Studio in Sweden, the players were essentially sat, waiting to see who would get hit. Now, as Echo had mostly done it legitimately, only two of their players were hit, while many others across the world, including Liquid, had been hit. It was a soft hand by Blizzard, but a clear marker. They were watching. And that was a sign of things to come. The tedious process of split runs began, dividing the players into small groups and asking helpers to fill over 60 raids of the easier pre-mythic version to obtain as much gear as possible. And the results of this are staggering. When the team finally is ready to begin the mythic version of the raid, they're usually equipped in gear that would take the average player six or more weeks to collect. While this process was ongoing on both sides of the pond, something interesting was happening. The mythic bosses were dying. And dying quickly. Instant Dollars, a top 10 guild in their own right, were crushing the raid. While it's absolutely not uncommon to see the early mythic bosses die before the top guilds even start, it can give you a sign of what's to come. It's always unknown as to how difficult the raid is actually going to be, and it can be very inconsistent. Sepulchre of the First Ones took three weeks to clear, and is WoW's most difficult raid in history. However, Aberus the Shadowed Crucible, the previous raid to this one was cleared in just four days. This raid, Amirdrasil, contains nine bosses. Instant Dollars claimed six of the nine bosses before either Liquid or Echo had even stepped inside. Now, you might think this would panic Liquid and Echo, but they've been here before. They have to stick to their strategy and hope the last bosses are hard. And oh boy, were they. The call is made. It's time for Mythic. With North America having the day head start as is normal, Liquid head in first and oh man, were they in great shape. In total, Liquid took a total of 17 pulls to match instant dollars days of effort and reach 6 out of 9, and begin staring down the fire giant himself, Smolderon. Coming into this race, Smolderon was one of the bosses predicted to be the first big wall to climb. Not only are his attacks absolutely brutal, but his high HP meant he was a huge DPS check. Blizzard also decided to buff his HP by 13%. Now, this is not uncommon to see on the later unkilled bosses once Blizzard has a grasp of just how much damage the guilds are capable of. And without the buff, Smolderon would have been smashed to pieces. However, impressively, Liquid only needed 56 tries to claim Smolderon's life, and in their first real day of progress, had reached the penultimate boss, Tindril Sagesmith. The feeling was, this race is going to be a short one. Unfortunately, Liquid ran into a very strange bug, sadly not uncommon for the NA champions who end up pulling a lot of the harder bosses before anyone else and finding these kinds of problems. Tindril's abilities were causing immense lag, making the encounter unplayable. Thankfully, Blizzard does now maintain close contact with the guilds and got to work fixing it while Liquid used their time effectively, heading into the five-man mythic dungeons to collect even more item upgrades. Echo's first day ended roughly the same way, with both guilds being 7 out of 9, and the 1 and 2 spots on the leaderboard being locked in until the death of this race. This is where the reset strategy comes into play. NA does get the patch a day early, but that also means their raid week reset happens earlier. Monday is NA's final day before everything resets and the bosses respawn. Now, of course, this means more loot is available, but it also allows Echo to make some choices as they have all of Tuesday to milk what they can from this first reset. 
Of course, this can also flip, and the new gear Liquid obtains on their Tuesday reset may allow them to kill the final boss before Echo gets the same gear, but thankfully, that hasn't happened yet in Race to World First history, as it would be disappointing on both sides. Echo always has to start from behind due to this reset. Historically, they tend to win when they can catch up fast and then overtake the competition, and this was their chance. Tindril Sage Swift is one of the most amazing fights Blizzard has ever made. Every action the players could have taken to bypass the mechanics or make the fight easier had been taken into account. It was smooth, had unbelievably punishing mechanics, and pushed each guild to the limits of its teamwork. It was also extremely hard. Blizzard made a minor nerf to the boss, but only nerfed a phase neither guild had seen yet, making it irrelevant to the race. Echo's strategy here was simple. On Monday, they didn't need to smash their face into Tindril. Liquid did. If Liquid had any hope of reaching Farak before the reset, Tindril had to die. Echo could allow Liquid to push into Tindril while they went off to the five-man dungeons to get more gear. They could learn as much as they can about the boss, then use all their Tuesday to kill Tindril and pull the final boss way ahead of Liquid. The stage was set. Liquid did not manage to defeat Tindril before their reset, so Echo was primed to pull ahead for the first time in this race. And then, disaster. Echo's healer Zalia, who was with us in Sweden, got very sick. As in, couldn't get out of bed sick. You might think that someone else could have stepped in, but it's just not that easy to replace someone of Zalia's level on a whim. Zalia not only is considered the best priest in the world, with a multitude of world titles under his belt, but also one of the best players in the world. But it is especially hard when he's had 150 attempts on an extremely hard boss to learn how to play it. Due to some roster changes and two people being unable to make the timing of the race to world first and help the healing team, Echo's healing leader, Ryson, was not actively playing, meaning he had no characters available to join the raid. In fact, Echo had no main healer to step in at that time. Echo literally had four healers for this tier, and one of them was gone. Enter Sol, a true champion who had been outside the raid to fill those shoes. Being less comfortable with playing the same spec as Zalia, he came in with his holy priest and got to work. In a remarkable turn of events, Sol not only picked up the fight along with great support from the team, but Echo did manage to make solid progress into the fight. A true gladiator. However, it did take some six hours of reprogress to get there. And for Echo, Tindril remained unkilled, and any advantage Echo thought was coming was lost. Liquid no doubt got a huge motivation seeing the setback of Echo and their chance to firmly stay in the lead. In typical Liquid fashion, they stormed through the reset and murdered every boss on their way back to Tindril. It was a spectacular demonstration of just how good Liquid are, managing to not only re-kill everything, but get Tindril to 24% and primed for a kill the following day. Echo's reset was not quite as smooth. Perhaps rocked by not taking the lead, they had some messy wipes on Nimue. While it may have only cost them an hour, it's the mental toll it takes to not be performing as well as the competition. They did get back to Tindril, with Zalia now back in action and pulling a 16-hour raid day after being completely ill the previous day. The following day was the real setback for Echo. Liquid claimed the world first Tindril after over 400 attempts, but still well within their normal raiding schedule, and then turning their stream off to begin work on the final boss, Farak, for the last couple of hours of their day, not showing the competition anything. Echo had to catch up. While many think that Echo has the advantage by being able to copy Liquid strategies due to the reset, the fact is, no one can win by copying what someone else has done. At the lunch break, Roger Brown talks to me and informs me that Tindril should be dead 
before the dinner break, to which I agreed. And it should have. It really, really should. Sadly, that was not to be the case. Echo just couldn't get everything working. Tindril is a very punishing encounter, and perhaps overconfidence led to the players being tilted, as well as the exhaustion of pushing on. Echo has a very precise sleep schedule to take full advantage of the reset time. 5am is when EU can begin progressing, and the players demand a minimum 8 hours sleep during the race to avoid fatigue. As the hours passed, Tindril was still standing, and Echo no, Liquid is working on the final boss. And that final boss may be easy. The team had to pull together physically and mentally to get the job done. At midnight, after 19 hours of gaming, well past their usual sleep timers, on the final pull of the night, after some players even logged out after the previous try thinking the night was over, Echo managed this. Seeds done. Right, so, right, so, so. Oh. Oh. First, it smells like first. Where is that? Where is that? Fate damage coming. Fate damage coming. Fate damage. Third. Just spread. Last one. Just spread. Last one. 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 Last Farak was not to be an easy boss and both guilds got to work. Here is where the story takes an interesting turn. Liquid have the advantage. They got there first and began getting that all important practice and experience. Farak is very well designed. Each step of the fight demands a huge amount of optimization from a micro and macro standpoint. It throws curveballs constantly with massive single target damage and develops into huge AoE damage and driving your healers into a frenzy of burst and constant damage on the raid. Liquid had a great streak of attempts that allowed them to reach the second phase of the fight early in their raid day, at which point they decided to once again turn off their streams so they wouldn't give any unnecessary information to the chasing team. Now the race to world first going dark is always controversial, and I have my own viewpoints, but for a team looking to win, it makes perfect sense. They are ahead, and see no reason to help the enemy. However, in a twist of fate, this helped Echo immensely. You see, neither Echo nor Liquid wants to copy strats. It's not what they do, or what allows them to really flex their muscles and become champions. It's also not wise to look at the solution to the puzzle if the solution is known. With Liquid Dark, however, Echo, for the first time since this race began, after nine long days, were able to play their own game. They knuckled down and began working, developing their own ways of tackling the puzzle, and they began to fly. In the back of their minds, though, as the hours ticked by, it was always a concern as to where Liquid had gotten to during their blackout. In the previous Aberus raid, when Liquid went dark, they came back online and were significantly further ahead on the final boss. It demoralized Echo, and they took the world first. As the clock ticked by, Liquid's stream came back. And they weren't ahead. They were at the same point. It was all tied up. I can't express to you the electricity that flowed through that warehouse in Sweden. It was as if Echo came to life. They finished their dinner and got right back to it. As more and more boss HP was removed and solutions were found, Echo started to pull ahead. Internally, lots of math was going on as to whether or not the boss was killable based on the health of the boss and the group setup. Echo had a 19% wipe on Farak as their raid day was coming to a close, and the boss was decidedly killable. But then, Blizzard nerfed the boss health by 4%. We do have Mini down on the Enhancement Shaman, with it looks like no batterers available, nor an Ankh, as we also have players now all frozen, it looks like. And wiping. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, and the hand on the forehead as this may be 
a weak or an issue with something they just changed about their UIs. Yeah, okay. Oh. Now we can take a look at what went wrong with the code there. Oh, no. Big Weeks is missing some timers on something. I don't know. That oh is an God. unfortunate way to lose 8 minutes and 30 seconds of very well-executed combat up until that point. Yeah, that has to be really, really frustrating. Now, in hindsight, this nerf made a lot of sense, and no one but Blizzard knew just how hard the final 10% of the boss would be. We found out after the kill that Blizzard weren't even sure what they were asking of the players was even humanly possible. But at the time, it felt like a sledgehammer had been taken to Echo. Echo were about to head to sleep. They had raided long and hard the last two days to catch up and were now in the lead. They had now proven the boss was killable and were getting to that final phase of the fight consistently. Vice versa, Liquid were just starting their raid day and the boss had just been made easier. What do you do with this information? Well, in Echo's mind, it was time to dig deep and kill. Immediately, a call was made to the players. What do you need? Energy drinks, favorite candy, techno music, whatever it is, we will get it. Production immediately put the casters into action to keep the show going all night long and Scripe rallied his troops to stand together. We also ordered pizza. I finished my second shift of the day at 3 a.m. when the team was on a five-minute break. Fatigue had set in. The kill was not close. And I suggested to Scripe to go and get some sleep. He was, of course, of the mind that Liquid could godpull and take away their victory, and it's true. That could have happened, but it was looking unlikely. At 4 a.m., they decided to call it and head to bed. Trying to sleep, knowing your competition could take the title isn't easy. Perhaps exhaustion will allow you to just pass out, but it is hard. With the minimum eight hours needed, it wouldn't be until 1 p.m. that the team would raid again. And until then, it was Liquid Show. As the sun rose over Sweden and I reached for my phone, I saw what I needed. The boss still lived. 6% remaining, and Liquid had also succumbed to fatigue and headed to bed. There was still a chance. At 12pm, the leaders of Echo arrived before the players, gathering to plan the day ahead. And at 1, the pulls began and no one, no one except Blizzard knew just how hard that 6% was to overcome. Farak's difficulty is very backloaded. While his other phases are tough, nothing compares to his final 10. The problem is the seeds and blazes. Blaze is an ability used from the start. Players shoot out fire waves to either side of them that hit other players. In phase 3, we add seeds. The twist is that if any of these seeds get hit by any boss mechanics, the raid instantly dies. At the start, there are four good seeds that are used to survive the dragon's roar periodically. However, when one good seed is used, two bad seeds join the fight. By the end, not only is the room considerably smaller due to the other mechanics, but you have eight seeds to protect and a lot of blazes covering the room. Only by absolutely insane gameplay can they be protected. As the hours ticked by, Echo reached 1.82%. And then, just a few hours later, Liquid did this. Lift goes down. They have a battle res left available for him as 6% left on the boss. Yeah, this is comes the worst play set of the whole fight. 4.5% on the boss right now. Fired up is down. No more battle res is left remaining. 3% onto the boss. Oh, no. 1.8%. No. After the race was done and the Echo team sat down to celebrate in a restaurant, Roger Brown asked me, was there any point in the race I thought Echo would lose? This was the only moment. Liquid is known for their consistency. It's one of their key strengths. After their low percentage wipe, I had a feeling that they were going to clean up soon. It was do or die for Echo to get the job done. Or not at all. After 13 days, 
Dozens upon dozens of hours of grinding, insane plays, fatigue, setbacks, ups, downs. It came down to just 0.7% between the two best in the world, live for everyone to see. I had nearly half a million people watching live. It happened. Here comes the blaze. Please, boys, focus up here. We need to do everything that we possibly can if we continue to push on through. The boss is going to die before they the second survive. set of blazes. Oh Echo is racing this to is the it. finish line. This is it. They're unstoppable right now. The blaze has gone out. And the and they're going to do it. They're going to do it. They are your new Dragon oh Fight champions. They have walked through hellfire and have come out on top. No! What happened is unimaginable. To take 13 days to get down to less than a percentage between the two best in the world, a coin flip separating who would win it. Viewers flicking backwards and forwards, both of them pulling at the same time. Every single pull could be the end. Cheering for your favorites, the bias, the switching, the casual viewers' minds blowing, and people coming in from all the games looking, why is World of Warcraft doing this? It's almost unimaginable to think that this will happen again. The sheer amount of circumstances required in order to get both of these teams who are so, so excellent and other teams climbing that ladder to try and get there, it's just unthinkable. The stars aligned. Will it happen again? I have no idea. But with Blizzard designing bosses like this, knowing that now the players could overcome these challenges, they will find a way. I hope we do see it again. But for now, Mirdrasil will go down in history as the best race to world first there has ever been. And while Echo did take the crown home, it could have easily gone the other way. These guilds are above everybody else in such a massive way. And now we're seeing the challenges that that level of effort and contribution and skill is able to deliver. I, for one, am overjoyed with what we got to see. And I cannot wait for the next one in The War Within. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you again. Bye-bye.